Hey, good afternoon, traders. David Floyd here with Aspen Trading Group on behalf of Real Vision Access. I'm back with another interview with a very interesting uh, friend and colleague. You remember back in January, I sat down with uh, Peter Brandt and we discussed um, the euro. Um, today, though, we're going to kind of switch topics a little bit. We're going to stick with the FX market. I've got uh, Brent Donnelly of HSBC Bank. He's an FX market maker and also the author of a book I strongly suggest you read, which is The Art of Currency Trading. And I'm not saying that just to do a book plug. I've been in this business for 20 plus years. Most of the trading books out there are, let's be nice in terms of my word choices, marginal. Um, when I read this one, I knew that Brent was actually a practitioner of what he did because of the way it was written and the way he spoke. You could tell that his process was very methodical. So I thought, what a better what better person to have on Real Vision Access to not only provide a little bit of insight as to what he does on a day-to-day -day basis at HSBC as a market maker, but let's get into his methodology and also let's maybe talk about what's happening in the markets currently because certainly there's plenty to talk about. So rather than me hogging all the time, Brent, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you on. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what a market maker does uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and then we'll kind of go from there. Sure. Uh, hey, Dave, and thanks a lot for thanks for having me on. Um, so the market making role is is pretty broad and it's been kind of um, dynamic over the years because of automation. So a lot of market making now in all the businesses at banks um, is automated. So what that leaves us to do is execute the big tickets. Um, and then also the role much more has become to be the expert in in your currencies. So like whatever currencies you trade, you need to be the expert in those things and then you can communicate with clients and help them strategize so that even if they are generally longer term and my perspective is shorter term, when they come in to transact, their time horizon obviously shrinks to, to much shorter and then we try to help them execute as best as possible um, to get the best or to create the least footprint on the, on the bigger tickets. And then in the meantime, um, I'm trying to be strategic about my own book and position in anticipation of what I think the market's going to do so that I'm not offside. Let's say if I think dollar yen's about to explode higher, then I want to be long some dollar yen so that when clients come in to buy dollar yen, uh, I'm not offside and I'm not caught wrong footed. So in order to do that, um, you use a lot of the same tools that anyone would use who's trying to uh, generate alpha. Um, which is, you know, whatever systems you use uh, and, you know, in terms of technicals, fundamentals, sen sentiment, cross-market, uh, lead lag, all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm sure we can dig into a little bit later. But um, so you end up using all of those techniques that uh, somebody sitting at home trading would use similar techniques, I would hope, uh, to, to anticipate short-term movements in the market. So um, just one more thing. So generally my way of looking at the world is very macro, but then the way that I actually act in terms of trading is quite micro. You know, if you wanna, if, if the guys back in uh, the control room there wanna bring up um, slide number nine, I um, mean, you just laid, gave me a, a great segue, but slide number nine has some of your rules of trading. And um, one of the things you say in there, and let me pull up slide number nine if here, if I got it right here, give me a second, get it on my screen. Hopefully everybody at home can see it. The autocorrect doesn't like my spacing. <laughs> there it is. It says right in here, these are some of the, the, this slide is titled main factors I consider when putting on a trade. And one of the ones you put in there was technical analysis. Can you said in parentheses, risk management and tactics. This is the line I liked, and I want to talk about this. Why I am skeptical of technical analysis as a forecasting tool, but why I still use it all the time. So um, talk to me about that. Talk to, talk to our viewers about that. Sure. So this is a this is a big topic, and uh, hopefully I'm not going to be too controversial because, I mean, there's no right answers. It's you know a lot of this, like I say at the start of the book, um, you know, take what what resonates with you and and ignore the rest. I think everyone has to develop their own style, and you know I read a lot of books when I was coming up trading, and a lot of it I didn't like, and some of it I liked, and you take what you like and you throw out the rest. So, but I do have a very strong view on on this specific topic is, is that generally technical analysis should be used for tactics and it should be used for risk management and a lot 
less for forecasting where the market's going to go. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. Number one reason is very few to actually zero traders that I've ever worked with that were very successful only use charts. Um, another reason is that it's that stuff is the easiest stuff to automate. So in the world of algorithmic trading, um, you know, if you think you can look, draw a trend line and then sell when that thing breaks, and that's going to be a long term uh, viable strategy in the world of, of algos, I think that's questionable. I just feel like it doesn't pass the sniff test of it's kind of like if if I'm sure a lot of your viewers play poker, it's kind of like knowing the opening hands in poker. Um, like it's a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. And that's what I feel like with technical analysis is that it, it gives you some indicators and it tells you, OK, if this breaks, I'm wrong. But as a forecasting tool, I just don't think that it's it's enough. And there's also quite a bit of research on this. So like one there's an entire book that back tests every single pattern. And generally out of sample, if you just back test something like head and shoulders, it doesn't back test profitably. Um, and you know the things that do back test profitably presumably have been automated. And as things get automated because of efficient markets, then that that a profitable pattern eventually gets arbitraged away. So I feel like more and more in recent in the recent era, the idea of of just trading pure charts and pure technicals um, is not profitable. And generally. There's a lot of empirical data to show that, and I've seen a lot of anecdotal evidence of, of that as well. Now, on the other hand, there's also evidence that shows that traders um, that use technical analysis outperform th those that don't. So those two things kind of contradict, and you'd be like, why is that the case? But I, the answer to that is pretty simple. It's that if you don't use technicals at all, if you buy something at 10 and it goes to eight, then obviously that looks like an even better buy because you're now, you know, it, it's 20% off. Um, so I think generally if you don't have some kind of technical system to risk manage your positions, then the lower something goes, the more you want to buy it. As opposed to what I think the most like direct usage of technicals is to say, okay, if this breaks, I'm wrong. Or if, if the, whatever you want to use, if it's, uh, you know, moving averages or trend lines or supports, um, to me also, again, this is a philosophical thing, so I'm not claiming to have the correct answer, but my philosophy after going into like a little bit more of the esoteric stuff is that there's a lot of room for subjectivity, um, like in Elliott Wave and GAN and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I've never found it useful for my process. In fact, I've gone more like Occam's razor style where you just, the simpler the thing is, the better. Um, and also, I think a lot of times you can uh, explain, and maybe this is easier if you sit at a bank, but a lot of times you can explain why something very simple like support and resistance works is because there's huge orders in the market and those people that are putting those orders in the market are patient and they have a medium term or long term uh, time horizon. So say somebody says, I, I want to be short the yen and I want to buy dollars but I'm not really that worried about it and I, I want to get a good entry point. So I'm going to put a bid for $2 billion at 108.50. And you know, if we get down there, maybe the rest of my portfolio is doing well, so I don't need to panic to buy it. And then suddenly every time it goes to 108.50, it seems to bounce off of that level. Um, and then people start noticing it and then all the you know bids start forming above and stops below that level. And so I think, the simpler technical analysis to me generally has an easier underlying explanation um, in in terms of flow and human behavior. Whereas when you get into like FIBOs and stuff like that, the the self fulfilling prophecy aspect is not there because if everyone's you know if you I actually have a thing in the book um, but it's not in these slides, but if you take um, a, a market that has moved a lot and then start drawing all the FIBOs on there. Like you can basically fill the thing so it looks like a Los Angeles highway interchange where there's just lines everywhere. And part of the reason that I say that is that you experience it a lot where people go, hey, that this is the 38-1 of this move. And then you go look and you're like, hmm, I, oh, I'm looking at a different move. And then all of a sudden there's like six different 38-1s and then the 50s and all that. So. Anyways, very long answer to say that I feel like it's a it's a tactics thing. Um, and also, I think the idea of something simple working is very appealing 
and also very unrealistic. So it's easy to sell um, like online uh, a package of technical, you know, holy grail kind of things, but it's a lot harder to sell like, hey, if you do a whole bunch of work and spend 10 years learning about this business, then maybe you might be able to make money, even though most people don't make money, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think the reality is that a lot more has to go into your process than just technicals. Um, but without technicals, I don't think you can really succeed any e either. So again, going to the idea of like necessary but not sufficient condition for success. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up. And again, one of the things that resonated, um, not only in my conversations that we've had from going back when I first kind of got introduced to you back in November, but it, it's very clear from the introduction in your book, you know, this whole notion of that everything can be boiled down really simply and it makes it easy for you to make money is a bunch of, it's a bunch of BS. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, people buy that up. So I'm really glad you gave that explanation because people don't want to be told, well, it's going to be a long, arduous journey and then you might not succeed. You know, they want to hear three simple steps. But, you know, I try to tell people when I can and it's kind of like talking to a um, like talking to an empty room. People don't want to hear that, but that is the reality of the business. And, you know, focusing in on very simple things and looking at other markets and other things just other than just charts is actually really helpful. And I know um, I'm kind of uh, speculating here, but I suspect like me, you know, you can only keep an eye on a few markets and become really intimately familiar with them. And that to me is where you can kind of gain an edge um, because that's something that, Maybe the algorithms don't have. There's that whole sense of feel, drawing on one's level of experience. Um, I know there's been studies done on on more of the um, the, the neurological aspect of it, but you know, the, the longer you watch something, whether it be you know you're becoming a you're becoming an expert attorney or a firefighter or whatever, you get this inane sense or this experience that you can call upon and sometimes it just happens where you're like, you know, I know it's time to go along the Euro here, but you don't logically know why that's the case, but your brain does have a way of interpreting all this vast amount of data. My point being is that if you're constantly on the prowl for the trade setup of the day, which of course is a bunch of nonsense, um, you're going to miss out on those really, really robust nuggets. So I'm really glad you brought up that that whole concept. It's not to burst people's balloons. It's to put them in, in, a, in a place where the, they, they go on the path where they have the most realistic chance of succeeding. Um, let's talk a little bit about position sizing. You had that in uh, one of your slides as well. It was also in slide number nine. Um, talk about position sizing and how important that is. I mean, you, I guess you could make the argument that even if you had a, a, a marginal um, marginally robust trading approach or system, whatever you want to call it, if you position size yourself properly and just simply get a statistical edge in terms of your size of your winners relative your loser relative to your losers, you can be a successful trader. But as we all know, when you get kicked a few times in the teeth with some losing positions, you start to trade less, and then you should when at the same time you should be position sizing more consistently. Talk to me a little bit about that. How do you do that on a day-to-day -day basis? How can, how do you keep your focus when maybe things aren't going so well, and yet you've got to put the right position size on? So yeah, that I mean, to me, that's probably the hardest part of trading is that you can develop whatever systems you want, um, and I mean, the hardest part of discretionary trading is you can develop whatever process, and however robust that process is, there's generally Oh, two extremes, either you tend to size too small because you're hesitant or you tend to size too big because this feels like a huge opportunity and everything feels like a five star trade. Mm -hmm. I tend to be more on that side of the continuum where like I tend to get a little bit too excited. So you're describing like a, a trigger shy person who's not doing well. And often I have the opposite extreme, which is if I'm doing really well, then I get overconfident and, um, and I position too big. And so I think the key to that is really just trying to be as systematic as possible and robotic as possible and having a spreadsheet. Um, so that was also a big challenge for me when I worked at a hedge fund was 
Um, at a bank, you kind of have a fixed amount of P&L that you know you're working with, whereas at a hedge fund, often your capital changes. Um, it might even change every month. Sometimes it was changing every month for me. So um, I, identifying like how am I going to size correctly when my capital is completely my double one month. Um, and so what that kind of taught me is being really rigid about just using a specific percentage of, of the amount of capital that you have t at risk. And again, I don't think there's a right answer. I think for each individual there's a right answer, but for yes. for the market, the world as a whole, um, I'm sure a lot of your viewers have read like two percent of your of your free capital as a as a guideline. Um, I feel like that number is something that you really have to develop, but it has to be you have to be very disciplined about it, because I think the hardest part is just following the rules of of properly allocating your capital and not, for me, not getting overly excited and thinking like this is a huge opportunity. There are so many opportunities if your time frame, like my time horizon is three hours to three days, generally is kind of yeah. how long I would hold a position, even though I might hold a view for much longer, like I might have the same view for a month, mm -hmm. but I might jump in and out over the course of a couple of days and, and, and you know, modify my, try to try to buy retracements in, in a bull market or whatever. Um, but I think that sizing correctly ends up probably being once you know the basics of whatever your methodology is, that tends to be the key because if you, especially if you, I mean, I had times when I didn't know what I was doing when I was younger, where you're just, you see some catalyst and you just jump in and you buy whatever, say you buy 50 million euros, but say the appropriate position size for your amount of p &L tolerance or capital was 15, not 50, um, then there's a tiny retracement and all of a sudden, you know, you've hit your daily loss limit and then it explodes higher, but you had to stop out on the retracement because your position was the wrong size. And it's really, really hard not to, if you're an aggressive um, person with a lot of risk appetite, I think it's hard not to be overconfident, um, especially as you have more experience and more and more trades appeal to you um, and the thing that really um, sort of other than just getting smashed in the face uh, by the market over and over that obviously teaches you the lesson mm -hmm. uh, but the other thing that has taught me over the years is collecting a lot of data on my trading so for example I know from many years of, of like I create a new spreadsheet every year and it has my P&L um, that I pretty much win 50% of days and I lose 50% of days. And even like I used to work at Lehman Brothers back in 2005 and I have those spreadsheets and it's it's kind of insane how the, consistent that is. Yeah. And what is determining my success in any given year is the ratio of my up days to my down days. Mm -hmm. uh, that's almost the, the entire determinant of, of a, a period for me. Um, so, but what that has given me is that when I'm wrong, I just kind of shrug and go like, okay, well, I'm going to be wrong literally 50% of the days in 2020. So how angry should I feel at the end of the day when I lose money? Really not, not angry at all. Cause that's just, you know, the nature of trading is that if you're constructing a, a process where 50% of the time you're wrong, but the other 50% you're, you know, you're making 1.6 x the, the losing days if you know what i mean then um it kind of gives you like a little bit of peace of mind so i would d strongly suggest um to your to your viewers that are especially people that are new i mean people that are experienced are probably doing this but anyone that's newer in trading collect data on your trading as much as possible um either individual trades if possible it depends how much you trade mm -hmm. um, or or daily data so another example hopefully this answer is not getting too long just cut me off no. If you're no, not at all. This is perfect. Um, another example of, of how data can, can help you is um, I when I was at the hedge fund um, a, a, a while ago, I used to keep track of my P&L in 30-minute increments oh, uh, as opposed to individual trades because generally I'm kind of in the day, I might be in and out of things and it, I'm maybe running a portfolio of five different currencies that all gives me maybe a net dollar long, but it's hard to, to differentiate like, okay, this is a trade and this is a trade when it's more of a portfolio. Yep. So instead of that, um, I did a snapshot every 30 minutes of what my P&L is. And this really shouldn't have been a surprise, but when you actually see the data, sometimes it just tells you something that maybe subconsciously you knew it, but 
either you didn't want to admit it because you feel stupid about it or you just didn't know in the first place. But what the data showed me was that my P&L was all, all generated, um, so I made a little bit overnight and then pretty much from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. was about 80% of my P&L and then from 11 a.m. till 5 p.m., which is usually when I left, um, was negative. So, and that's, if you've traded FX, as obviously you have, Dave, um, it's kind of obvious when you see that statistic because the volatile and directional moments in, in FX are yeah. from London open to New York, 11 a.m. And then after 11, yeah. things die down and it yeah. becomes random. And then I started thinking back to, um, in, in the 90s, I was day trading um, the, the NASDAQ bubble, and I can, had completely forgotten about it, but it was the same phenomenon that, except that I made a lot of money on the close. So like it was tempting to go home because I knew around noon in the NASDAQ bubble that I'd always stop making money at that time. It just, things, when things are-, are in New York, are, yep. <laughs> yeah, it just gets super random, and things just oscillate more based on random flows that you can't identify. Uh, but I used to always stick around because the close was a good time to trade. Yeah. So what I ended up doing in, in those days, um, because I was working for myself, I was trading my own money at that time, was I just would trade till noon and then I would go for lunch and then I just usually walk around. I was living in Toronto at that time. Then I just walk around Toronto for two hours and, and just basically try to stay away from the office as long as humanly possible. Um, so all that to say, if you collect a lot of data on your on your trading, um, I think you can learn a lot. And I, again, like I always kind of err on the side of simplicity. Like I, I'm familiar with Sortino ratios, and and like Sharp is a pretty simple, but um, like the more complex ways of analyzing P and L. And for me, I always come back to the simpler stuff of like your win days versus your down days. Uh, is that ratio good? Is it improving? Is it worsening? Um, you know, what percentage of the days do you win? I know some traders can win on 60% of the days. Um, so like that is a very personal thing. It depends on how you trade. And uh, mm -hmm. so, but I think knowledge of that and collecting that data can, can really help you improve your process and just see little leaks and you go, okay, well, that's, that's a leak, and now how can I plug that? And sometimes the leaks are pretty easy to plug once you know about them. You know, there's so many different directions we could go on this. I mean, you and I have had a very, now that I'm hearing your previous background, you and I have followed an almost identical path. I day traded for almost 10 years, same type of thing. I, tr I did it on the West Coast, so I had very different hours, but after 8.30 in the morning, never traded. I'd come back for the close, traded for an hour or two, and then that was the day. There was nothing... Um, there, but what I think is really helpful about having that background, which both of you and I have, is that we we've seen trade flow at the most microscopic level, and I think that does add value, even when you're trading slightly longer time frames. I mean, what you and I both do is still considered active trading, um, but having that background of, of being able to read order flow a little bit, I think, is really helpful. So this has been extremely helpful in terms of that discussion and I, I suspect a lot of people will take some good nuggets away from it now I know one of the things that people are going to want to hear even though you've already said you know hey technicals is one piece of it what are some of the other pieces you look at um, again I know everybody has to find their own path but I know you're probably looking at macros are you looking at options are you looking at related markets correlations you know give us a sense on um, Again, it's not going to be a neat and clean package. It, trading isn't, but maybe give viewers a sense of some of the other things that you look to incorporate into developing a, a trade idea or a thesis. Sure. Um, so the way that I generally look at the world is you have to understand the macro, but if you're trading short term, what you're trying to do is identify, okay, the, currently we're in this equilibrium what's going to push us to a different equilibrium and and how much are we going to move and can i anticipate that before it happens and so some of that is is simply if you understand everything about the current macro environment and a headline comes out then you can react in a in an efficient way to that and know like okay this is meaningless this is not meaningless you know how the, the a good example of that is how the coronavirus um, headlines have slowly decayed in terms of their importance because the, the visceral fear in the market has dissipated. And so after a while, you understand that that it takes a little bit more to move the needle. So another example would be people have 
kind of come to the conclusion that the ECB can't do too much more because negative rates are hurting the banking system and maybe they don't really stimulate anything anyways. So the panacea now is German fiscal, uh, German fiscal stimulus. So if that headline comes out, that's going to be a major game changer. So I mean, those are pretty obvious examples, but I think just constantly being aware of what the macro is and what can move the needle and what will not move the needle is really important. And then, so I try to understand like the fundamentals of, and I'll just go back to one thing you said about specialization. Um, I, at various times, have gone more like touristy, as people would call it, and then I've always come back to, yeah. for me, it's G10FX is the thing that I'm good at, and um, whenever I've deviated, I've learned a lot of stuff, but it has never been tremendously profitable. So like me trading oil or gold or, or things like that, or S&Ps being probably the most difficult thing in the world to trade, um, I've always come back to G10FX. And there's a guy that I know that used to work at a hedge fund, and when he started, they said, okay, the only thing you're allowed to trade is Norway. So you can trade Norwegian rates, Norwegian equities, and right. that's it. And his um, career path really benefited from that because he understood, he flew to Norway and like met the guys from the central bank and stuff. And I think he really benefited from that learning that the uh, to me a lot of the edge comes from just being an expert in that little thing so like if you if you're trading virgin galactic and and tesla and those are the only two things you're trading i think you have a lot better chance of having an edge because then you start really reading everything about it and you start thinking oh okay there's some option strikes up here and like okay the maximum range for the day is usually you know x percent and this is like a five standard deviation move you start getting a good feel for what's reasonable volatility um, what moves the market what headlines matter what headlines don't so i feel like um that is generally what i'm trying to do is like understand the current macro equilibrium and then surf the waves as new information comes in and the new information doesn't have to be headlines. The new information can also be like policymaker announcements. So central bank meetings are usually really big for us because obviously there's generally a correlation between rates, interest rates, and, and FX. Yeah. So um, so one of the rules that, that I try to follow is just doing the work. Um, so there's a lot of speeches and a lot of like boring stuff that you have to read um, to, to be to keep abreast of what the central banks are thinking. Um, but to me, that's like absolutely necessary. Like if you're not willing to read some boring speeches from the Bank of Canada, you can't really understand their reaction function. And, and so the Bank of Canada is actually a good example because their reaction function has changed a lot over the years. So they were extremely worried about the oil collapse in 2016, for example. And Governor Polaz spoke a lot about that in all his speeches and in the meetings. So you knew that the correlation between oil and, and Canada was going to be really high. And then after a while, once that sort of energy, mini energy panic dissipated, um, they became more concerned about uh, real estate. So then, you know, as they're hiking rates into a heavily indebted economy, you know that they're going to always have one eye on the housing market. So I think um, doing all the work is really like it sounds basic, but it's it's it is a lot of work and you have to be really committed to it and you have to you know filter through some a lot of boring stuff to get to the interesting stuff um but again i think you need to do all the reading and and really be like as deep as possible on a minimal number of products to be good and i don't think you can be really good at more than like five products and like when i say products i think one universe like stick to one universe and then specialize in a few products. Yep. Um, some people can do it, but even the people that are really, really good at that, like super macro hedge fund PMs, what they tend to do is more like pivot. So it's like, okay, rates is the thing now and FX is quiet. So then the 80% of their risk will be in rates and they'll be super, you know, in the weeds on, on all their rates trades. Um, you, I don't think you very often see um, anybody that's really good at trading going like 25 25 25 25 across four asset classes and stuff that's more of like a portfolio investor real money kind of approach and that's that's not as much of a, a trading approach um so then in terms of surfing the new narrative so like the main thing that i think i'm good at is understanding the current narrative and then identifying like oh something's changing here like there's a new narrative trying to sneak in 
And obviously there's all these cl narratives clashing all the time. So there's a skill in understanding, okay, this thing actually matters and this thing doesn't. Um, and then if you combine, so say, say there's been a, a long ongoing narrative of, um, I mean, this isn't true, but let, let's just say the market's been selling euros for six months and everyone thinks, so this was true in 2015, ECB was doing QE and all the corporates were issuing, issuing in euros and euro was collapsing. And you know, when euro was at 105, everyone thought it, when it was going from 135 to 120, people's targets was 120, then they moved their targets to 110, then it was at 105, so everyone moved their targets to 95. And then the narrative started changing as like the, the corporate selling kind of drew, dr dried up at that time. And then the ECB wasn't quite as dovish and it kind of seemed like maybe they were getting a little, people were getting a little bit annoyed at how much the currency had moved. Um, and then, so you sort of felt like, hmm, the narrative's changing, but people are still like mega short because of the old narrative. And trying to find those points is, is like the most, um, I think the most exciting and profitable trades that I've had have been correctly identifying when the market is heavily positioned one way in, and all in on a certain narrative, and that narrative is losing its its um, its luster. Um, so the only way you can really do that, and I guess that's an advantage um, if you have a network like you do, where you, you know you talk to a lot of people, so you get a sense of like, if I put out a bullish S and P call, I'm saying if you do, um, do I get a lot of angry emails about it? Um, if mm -hmm. yes, then that is an indicator, you know. So the indicators aren't just looking at the CFTC data. Um, which I'm personally not a huge fan of, um, just because it's very slow moving. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of ways to get sentiment, whether, you know, if you work at a bank, obviously you talk to a lot of clients. If, if in your case, you talk to your clients. Um, but if you don't have clients, you have Twitter and um, you, know, you have uh, LinkedIn and all those kind of places and you have friends to talk to and you can get a sense of, okay, the sentiment is extreme. Now, one mistake that I made a lot um, when I was young because like it feels great to feel smart because if you're the if everyone's short and you're long and you make money, you feel super smart, but yeah. it's a really bad way to trade. Um, so I, like reflexive contrarianism is not a good idea because you're just basically fighting every single trend because generally human beings follow like you know positioning follows price. So if something's going down, people want to sell it, and things trend a lot. So um, being reflexively contrarian is the worst, the worst. I would never advise people to be contrarian all the time. It's more like um, selective contrarianism or more just like thinking for yourself, like thinking about what's the, it, sometimes it just seems like there's only one hypothesis out there in the world and there's only one narrative. And those are the times when you think, hmm, like what would be an alternative hypothesis? Um, and it doesn't mean you have to go the other way right away, but then you can start using, um, you know, technicals to, like you say, okay, this trend is way overdone and I don't even think this narrative is correct anymore, but, you know, the fifth wave of a big move can be, can be devastating if you're trying to sell into it. So use some kind of indicator, maybe just something simple like a tw five day, 20 day crossover to say, okay, I'm bearish fundamentally because this narrative is BS in my mind, and it's like it passed its expiry date and everyone's limit long, but I'm not gonna just go right out into the gale force winds. I'm gonna wait until the, the, you know, the momentum turns a little bit, and then um, ideally you get some kind of top, and then moving averages turn over, and then you can sell with the stop loss above the top. So mm -hmm. what I tend to do on, on those kind of trades is then I just pick my level, and I say, okay, I'm, I'm trying this trade, and if I'm wrong, I'm out. And you know I might try it again sometime, but um, I try to just, especially when I'm going counter trend, just be really diligent about, okay, this is my, I know I'm going against the trend here, so let me take a shot and I'm risking X amount of money. And if it breaks, then, you know, that's life. And 50% of the time I'm wrong anyway, so no big deal. Yeah, I think, you know, I think there's a time and a place to kind of be that contrarian. Um, you know, one of the things that I do, I don't know if it's something you do is, but if I'm, if I'm thinking, let's say, use the Euro, I mean, it's just been beaten down, you know, at some point it'll bounce. My approach typically would be, you know, let the market prove it to me first. Let this, let's see if the market can kind of squirm up a little bit. And if it does it in, let's say, in an impulsive manner, since I look at it from an Elliott Wave perspective, um, you know, that might be a clue. Like, okay, I can probably dip my toe in the water here, but I know if we break the low, I'm out. 
So, because I think so many people, are, they're, they're so tempted to want to call the bottom or the top, because one, if you do it, boy, does it feel good. Yeah. But obviously your your chance of doing that is usually like 20 to 10 or 15%. It's, it's very low. Um, but I do think there's a time and a place to place those trades, but it's usually few and far between. I think trading in the overall direction of the trend tends to be, at least for me, tends to be the, the, the better approach. I wanted to get to a few questions that people have been um, writing in here in real time. Um, and we can just kind of touch upon these briefly because we've got about four or five of them to get to, and I'll, I'll kind of pepper them in here. Sure. Uh, some of the technical indicators uh, that you use, if you'd mind sharing a few. Um, I know charts is just one part of it, but you know a lot, a lot of people do use charts. They're curious what you're using for some of your indicators. Sure, so I mean, like I said, I tend to keep things fairly simple. So, I mean, I think everyone's familiar with, you know, the basic reversal patterns and, and, you know, support and resistance and things like that. One thing that I think has become more useful over time is the second derivative stuff. So there's a thing um, that I call slingshot reversal. Um, if you Google that, like if you Google my last name um, and slingshot reversal, it's on the Internet. But um, which essentially the idea is when there's a really major chart point that a lot of people are watching. Mm -hmm. um, so say say something's been rallying for a long time and we're at you know a hundred and dollar yen and that's a round number and everyone's watching that and everyone thinks exporters are going to be selling there. Um, it, the, the key I think is that a lot of people are watching it, but I'm bearish, so I I want to wait until I see what happens there. The uh, the best setup I feel like is when you take out the level and then you go back below it. Um, so I feel like at that point, there's so much energy that builds up around the significant reference points or like major, major levels that a lot of people are watching um, that I feel like you take all the energy out and then anyone who was short has stopped out. Anyone that wanted to do anything has basically done it. And then I feel like it's a lot safer to be short. So it's kind of like the second derivative, the same thing with triangles. Like if a triangle breaks up, but I'm not bullish for fundamental reasons, I'm not gonna buy it just because the triangle broke. I just don't feel comfortable with that. Sure. I will only follow a, a continuation pattern if I already have a prior that like I wanna be long and I'm waiting for the triangle to break, then I'm happy to, to own it. Yeah. Uh, but say in a case where there's something where I'm bearish and it breaks the triangle to the top side and then comes back into the triangle, then I feel like that's a really powerful setup where I feel that it's way more likely that then we're going to slam through the bottom of the triangle because the break to the top side, you know, gives the gives the bulls confidence. It sucks people in. It stops out all the shorts. And so I like to try and think of like, I guess it's kind of like Keynes's beauty contest thing where instead of thinking about, you know, what's the most beautiful setup, think about what are the setups that people think are the most beautiful. And then when they reverse, I think that can often be a powerful uh, signal, especially if it happens at the end of a trend, because a lot of times you're going to see like a blow off type of move. Mm -hmm. uh, so the slingshot reversal, that's, that's what I'm talking about. I like that a lot. Um, and then, I mean, just basic support and resistance, like I said, I find is, is useful. And then I do a lot of like really basic moving average stuff. So if you just throw a moving average onto a trend in, in FX, like say, an, say you take an hourly um, euro dollar chart and you just put a couple of simple moving averages on there, like a 20 and 100, a lot of times it'll fit the trend really well. Um, and so what I like to do is just essentially, it's kind of like drawing a trend line, but fit the, tre fit the moving average to the current trend and then it just gives you like a simple thing of like, okay, whatever was driving this thing lower has lost a little bit of its power for, for whatever reason. And yeah. so when you break above the moving average, it's super simple, but then you think, okay, well, you know, the, and, and also I think there is sometimes algorithmic reasons why these things are holding as well. So if you're running a giant TWAP, sometimes you'll just see a thing, uh, a, a price that's just a perfect 45 degree angle for four hours, and then when it when that 45 degree angle breaks, probably that's a signal that someone was running a gigantic TWAP and they're done. Yeah. Um, so a lot of times I think those, again, keeping it really simple like a moving average breaking is a good signal. Um, but what I always like to have is like my set of priors before any of, I'm doing any of that kind of analysis. So like I'm dying, this isn't true, but let's just say I'm dying to be long Aussie because I think China stimulus is going to overwhelm the negative impact of coronavirus. Like that's a reasonable thesis, um, but right now Aussie's breaking to new lows, and like there's no, 
reason chart wise to own Aussie. Um, maybe there's a fundamental reason, but I would then wait and I'd say, okay, I'll put like a five day and a 20 day on an Aussie chart. And you know, when it, when something turns, then that'll give me a signal that, okay, now it's safe to express my thesis and not just buy into this raging downtrend uh, for, for no reason. Um, because I think a lot of things like where you're trying to, and actually that's a good example, I think, of a future narrative shift that probably will happen and that people are trying to time right now is the negative impact of the virus versus the positive impact of the stimulus which will follow. Uh, so it's actually a decent example, I think, because it's it's a kind of narrative shift that you can maybe catch and then you know be long Aussie for for the big China stimulus. If, but that's a huge if, and it's not happening right now. So you use technicals to to say, okay, when this thing breaks the, you know, when the five and the twenty day cross over, or when spot goes above the twenty day, or whatever you want to pick. Um, and I feel like mostly it's not that important what parameters you pick. Mm -hmm. I feel like, like I know when I, I remember reading John Murphy's book, you know, way, way back in the day. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about how you can optimize things and stuff. I feel like, you know, whether you're using a hundred day or 200 or 252, because that's how many trading days there are in a year. I feel like it's more like you adapt the, the, parameters to the market and you know if you see that like in euro sweden the 200 hour always seems to match the trend then okay i guess that's kind of the speed that 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 euro sweden moves at um so i feel like it's pretty arbitrary i guess so it i don't do a lot of back testing and, and that on, on trying to optimize all the parameters because mm -hmm. i feel like the odds of the 182 hour being optimal, even if you back testing, that's what was optimal in the past. I feel like out of sample, the odds of that being the optimal one are probably low anyway. So I'm using it more as like, um, you know, as a as, as guardrails to keep me on track, not as like a laser focus kind of thing. Let me uh, touch upon something else because you're talking about using <clears throat> support and resistance. You're you're coming up with some catalysts that might bring you into a trade or bring you out of a trade. Um, I think I know your answer on this, but the question we get here from Edward is, you know, what are your thoughts on using stop losses? I mean, the obvious answer is you, you need to use them. I've talked with people over the years that don't use them and they have their own rationale. You know, tell me what your thoughts are on it. I mean, I read your your reports, so I know you use them. But you know, give us your give us your two cents on stop losses. So, uh, in my rules of trading, rule number one: don't blow up. Uh, avoid risk of ruin above all else. So, yeah. Recently, I every single trade that I put on, I have a stop loss. I have a scratch pad in front of me. As soon as I put a trade on, I write down what my stop is and I automate it. So, um, I have a system where you know if this trades do this, and every single trade that I put on, I always have a stop loss. And at night, um, I try to not obsessively check the market. So I always leave a stop and a take profit every single night. So whatever positions I have, um, I always have a stop and I always have a take profit. And the reason I think that take profit's important too is that, um, you know, the whole feeling of like every trader knows this, when something's ripping higher, it like people on NFX say, oh, it looks bid. All that means is that it's ripping higher. It doesn't mean that it will continue to rip higher. Uh, like people say that as if it's a forecast, like it looks bid, so it's gonna keep going up. But I think generally it's really hard to sell into a raging bid market. But usually if you, you know, if you bought something at 100 and on day one and your plan was to sell it at 101 and four hours later it's at 101, you should be selling it. Like you shouldn't be saying, oh, it got there four hours. Let's, you know, maybe I can sell it at 102. Um, because I think as soon as you put the trade on any trade, you just become so biased and you're like visceral, emotional, you know, like the, the, there's a great book about this, um, called the hour between dog and wolf. Um, oh, yeah, I'm sure you've read that one. Yeah. So the second that you put a trade on, there's physiological changes that are happening in your body. So don't trust yourself to do the right thing when the thing's exploding higher automated as much as you possibly can. So I'm now I'm talking about take profits. But I feel like um, it's really easy to to trade badly on good trades because you're kind of in the money and you're feeling good and you feel overconfident. So I try to automate as much as possible, um, both on the stop loss side and the take profit side. Um, and even if you, you know, like I feel like 
there's a certain amount of false precision in, you know, if, if your take profit target is 101, you know, you don't really know if it's going to be 100.96 or 101.22 or whatever. So I usually kind of, if I have a bigger position, I'll scale a little bit, but sure. around a narrow band, um, just so that if, if the high is one pip from where my take profit was, I don't feel sad all the, the next day. Um, yeah. So I guess my feeling, I feel very strongly that, you know, every trade should have a stop loss on it um, because you know, half of, of, I mean, the two main things to having a career in trading, one of them is just surviving and, and anything can always happen, right? So, you know, you go to the bathroom and you come back and the German fiscal stimulus was announced and you just like lost your entire trading account. I mean... I remember actually when I was day trading, that happened to a couple of people. They literally lost their entire account on on one trade in the in the Nasdaq bubble. Um, yeah. And if you love trading and you want to survive, then you know you, I think you have to have stops. Um, and the other thing to to survive is you have to adapt, um, which is not exactly what we're what you asked. But just since I said there's two things, yeah. <laughs> the second thing yeah, is think, being able. I think to that's adapt. I think that's really important because again, it, we started the conversation with this, and we'll kind of segue towards the toward the wrap here. Is that it's it's never what I'm doing now is slightly different than the way I approached the market a year ago. Fundamentally, it's the same meaning I have my basic approach and you have your basic approach, but you're always having to kind of pivot and look for some different things to bring into the narrative. Um, one of the things I think you touched upon, and again, I learned this way back in my day trading days, and I still do it now, and regarding the take profits, um, I remember back, you know, on Fed announcements, we'd be day trading and we might be trading Citibank or whatever it was. And whenever the, this is back when actually a human being was still on the floor making a market. And mm -hmm. whenever they spread their bid ask and put a big bid up and nothing on the offer, I was always offering out my stock, meaning my long position, because that was just a sign that there was no liquidity. The, 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 the specialist was trying to get anything he could into the book. It was basically... I don't want to say a free lunch, but I was basically helping out the specialist. He was advertising, I need stock. I'm already long. I'll give it to you. And inevitably, that was probably the best place to sell it. And I still think in this day and age, when you hit these liquidity pockets, I look at that as I got really lucky. My analysis was good, but let's be honest, I got lucky. Something happened to create that pop, whether it be up or down. Why don't I just take the profit? Because normally that doesn't happen. Right. And right, it's so and easy to be like, well, if you already got 100 pips, why why shouldn't I go for 200? Right, and if you could talk to your prior self who was originally putting on the position and you told them, hey, you, you can make 100 points on this trade, you'd be like, yeah, absolutely, I'll take it. But then when the 100 points happens, you're hesitating because like it quote unquote looks bid or whatever. So I think having the plan beforehand, before all those physiological markers start picking up, um, then forces you hopefully if you're robotic a little bit about it to say like okay i know this looks like it's going to explode another 200 points but my plan was to sell here so i'm going to sell here and that's that and it's actually interesting what you said about the market making thing because very very rarely um like maybe once every three years um there'll be a time when the ecn in a currency doesn't have a bid or an offer like one or the other like one time euro norway was absolutely go going crazy and no one knew why and there was a bid and there was no offer and weirdly that is the few times like i've maybe seen it about 10 times in 20 years that's always the absolute extreme so it's like the the absolute panic and i think looking for those panic markers is actually a, a good strategy like you can, generally panic subsides you know and and so those intraday periods of madness if you're getting to your take profit, you just take it and be happy. And if it keeps going, who cares? You know, you made your money and you, there's going to be lots more trades. You, you can't go broke taking a profit. <laughs> uh, you can go broke if you violate the rules of the drawdown table. And that's a conversation in a, in a completely different level. Brent, I could go on for a lot longer and we could go off on a lot of different tangents. But, you know, we're up against uh, the realities of uh, running a live program. So we're going to have to wrap it up there. But I, for one, thought it was a great discussion. I thought it illuminated a lot of the things behind trading that often is not heard. Uh, we often see, you know, kind of the shiny fun stuff that may not be realistic in terms of how it actually works when you're actually in the trenches. So I think you brought a really, really amazing perspective and I really do appreciate it. So um, 
want to thank you on behalf of Real Vision, all the Real Vision subscribers. And I'm glad we've had a chance to kind of get to know one another over the next few months. And I know we'll continue the dialogue um, going forward. So Brent, thanks again very much. Really appreciate it. And thank you. I had fun too. Thanks a lot. It's cool.